what up players, Wobots to up in this mud, welcome to part 1 of how to paint a thousand suns trooper. For this video you're going to need the following, Sotek green, Temple guard blue, Adabadabadon black, Lead belcher, Balthazar gold, um, oh, tabard. Rakarth Flesh and for the washes Drakenhof Nightshade and Lamian Medium so base coats trim a little bit of the details and some highlights in the next stage we're gonna highlight back up to uh, the kind of light blue while keeping some of that turquoise look in the recesses so stay tuned for that and we're also going to be doing some highlighting in the next stage. So, uh, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoy the video. Stay tuned for the next one. Hey right, everybody, welcome to my Thousand Suns tutorial. Here we've got our Thousand Suns Space Marine built up using the Chaos Space Marine box as well as the conversion kit with the Thousand Suns. And that's a product you can get from Games Workshop. It includes the resin head, torso, guns, shoulder pads. So. We're going to go today and we're going to hopefully get through the base coats and the washes. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take Sotek Green. This is going to be the first color that we paint our model with. So as a base coat, or even before this though, the first step you want to do is you want to prime your models. And I prime all of my models with a primer called Duplicolor Matte Gray Primer. And then once that's done, you let that dry for a little while, and then you can get started with your base coats. Base coat means that it's the first coat of paint that goes on your model after the primer. So you want to make sure that you're not spreading it too thick. That when you take it out of the pot, you use something like a wet palette, or you just dilute it if you've got something, a setup kind of like mine right now, where you've got cardboard or, or something nearby that you can do this on, then some people like to thin their paints by just dragging it on their cardboard, on the cardboard of their table. <clears throat> I used to paint on a wooden table, and uh, it was, I don't know why I hadn't thought of covering it with something, like newspapers or nothing like that. It was just this wooden studying table that I've had in my room forever, Oops. and I guess after a while I noticed it getting all all flaky with paint and then I thought oh shoot I should be covering it so yeah, and I cover it with cardboard so, oh my goodness I really need new poster tack for these painting videos I use poster tack on top of a piece of cork you could also use you can also use um, an empty paint bottle or a empty prescription medicine bottle something that you can wrap your hand around very easily for those of you who've been with me a while thank you for always kind of bearing through these little introduction pieces those little tidbits are meant for newcomers to my channel yeah so let's talk about thousand suns reading the novel right now by Graham McNeil Something about Graham McNeil, his writing style is so imaginative and creative, and he creates these worlds that are not, you know, chained to the, the the 40k setting as we know it. Since all of his Horus Heresy stuff takes place 10,000 years in the past, they can really be creative about how they go about their um, cre creating worlds and universes, as long as they are true to the the main stuff, Primarchs, the Emperor, the Great Crusade, and then Horus's eventual fall to chaos. I should do a Horus Heresy Fluff Hunters one day. Hmm. A uh, Thousand Suns, one of my one of my least favorite legions when I first started playing. I thought the whole Egyptian motif with the head crest was kind of dumb. I didn't really like. The look of the models, but they have definitely grown on me over the years. <clears throat> okay, while we're letting that dry, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to pull out my oh, yeah, Temple Guard Blue. What I'm going to be doing with this is brushing over the Siltec Green. So I want to make sure you kind of dilute it in your wet palette. This is your first real uh, highlight color. It's going to go everywhere, so it's okay if the Siltec Green isn't 100% dried yet. Ideally, you would wait until it's totally dry if you want to, but I'm I'm kind of looking at this from the the viewpoint that um, you're going through these guys one at a time. So batch painting, if you're going to be batch painting a whole squad of these, then probably more often than not, by the time you get to the end of your ninth or tenth guy in your squad, the paint that you painted on the first guy will be completely dry, or at least on its way to becoming completely dry. And so what I'm kind of doing today is a truncated version of that, since I'm not batch painting a squad, we're only pa painting this one guy. Uh, so you could do it either way. Some, some people like to paint one guy all the way up to finish, or maybe do a whole step, like base coat everything, and then move to the next one and base coat everyone all the way down to the end of their squad and then get started with the shade and the highlights. Uh, some people will only do one step. Like they'll only paint the legs, the base coats for the legs. And then they'll go to the next guy and they'll only paint the base coats for the legs all the way down to the end. And then they'll come back and they'll only paint the base coats for the torsos, so on and so forth. Now, either of these methods can work. Personally, I find that it's less exhausting to do to do it like that because you don't really see how much you have to paint and how much you still have left. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Okay, so let's step away from the blue of the armor because the blue of the armor is going to be the focal point, right? When you look at a Thousand Suns Marine, if you look at my finished model here, the most eye-engaging thing is the blue accented with the yellow. So we want to make sure that we give it ample time to dry for us. Oh, we also want to make sure when you're painting your models, you always want to make sure that the paint gets to all of the locations. Because of this big head crest, you're almost at a disadvantage of finding all the nooks and crannies for your paint to go in. So you just want to double check that you've got all of that done correctly. Rack our flesh, we're going to paint the tabard. Most of your Thousand Suns guys will either have the torso with the Thousand Suns iconography and all that stuff on it, or the Eye of Zinch, and they'll also have these tor uh, tabards. If you're using a regular Chaos Space Marine, there's also two tabards in the kit that will allow you to attach them to your two regular Space Marine guys, or Chaos Space Marine guys, so that you can have these tabards. Basically, everyone in your squad should have one of these tabards except for the sorcerer who's got a whole like sorcerer's skirt so it's a safe safe bet that you're going to be painting nine eight of these you get eight figures in a box or enough conversion kits to make eight models and then your sorcerer makes nine Nine is the sacred number of Zinch. All of the four Chaos Gods, I don't know if you know this. I didn't know this until maybe last year or the year before. Uh, very recently in the hobby that each Chaos God has a sacred number associated with them. So Slanesh is six. Zinch is uh, nine. Nurgle is seven. So the, the numberology plays a lot in the, the books and the codexes. Hopefully the codexes, actually. I'm not sure about the codexes, but in the books... Um, Mortarian, the Primarch of the Death Guard, and his personal bodyguard, the Death Shroud, they're always located within uh, 40, 49 steps of him. 7 times 7, 49 steps at all times. 
in uh, the Thousand Sons fluff, they used to have 10 great fellowships or companies. Then one of them was almost completely wiped out. So Magnus, the Primarch of the Thousand Sons, kind of moved them around, moved the survivors around into the other nine, and then kept them at nine. He kept them at nine, so that's Zinch's favorite number. Little stuff like that where we kind of see the number planted in the books. All right, the next thing we are going to do is we are going to take some uh, Abaddon Black and with this paint we're going to paint the sh uh, casings of the bolters. So looking at this guy, this is the resin conversion bolter for, for the Thousand Suns, so it's got like a little hawk head motif, very Egyptian-esque, but uh, the, the housing for the bolter, the case, is on the top there. For a regular Chaos Space Marine that you're converting, you would just be like normal using the black on the upper casing of the bolter. I actually got A Thousand Suns, the novel, a long time ago, like right when it first came out. And its companion piece, The uh, Burning of Prospero. And I, I thought it was really cool when I read about it in The White Dwarf that you have these two novels telling of pretty much the same big event when the Space Wolves go to Prospero to uh, basically eradicate the Thousand Suns from the two different viewpoints of the different legions. And you get into both of these books and you get to learn about their specific legions uh, separately from each other. So they, they're a threat in each other's books, but the focus shifts from one to the other. I think that was a really, really cool direction to take. Okay, Lead Belcher. And yeah, so I had this book a long time ago, and I tried to get, I tried to read it, get into it, but I was so into the Warhammer 40k aspect of it, I, I wasn't really, it was like the first real Horus Heresy book that I'd read, I hadn't read any of the other ones yet, and I thought, oh, a Thousand Suns, I know, I know a little bit about them, I've seen them in the, in the codexes and stuff, and uh, yeah, I wasn't prepared for how different a Horus Heresy novel can be compared to a regular Black Library 40k novel. And that's because in the world of 40k, like I said, you know most of the fluff and everything. <coughs> uh, everything that happens in the 40k novels, uh, you can kind of guess due to reading the codexes and the rule book. And if you're familiar with the 40k history, then it's kind of all very familiar. So I was kind of expecting something like that, and what the Horus Heresy novels are, are almost a look at all of the different legions, characters, and histories that were shaped during the uh, Crusade era, the era of the Crusade. So each of the legions were encouraged to have their own kind of personality, and you've got like the world eaters who are known to be savage, bloodthirsty, brutal, berserker killers. And you've got the space wolves who are not really that much different from the world eaters, except the fact that they have a little bit more of a, a very specific th visual theme, which is that uh, all the, the wolf motifs and whatever. And uh, world eaters are more of a gladiator kind of kind of kind of theme to them their special unit the what are they called uh the ones that forge world came out with they're all kind of fighting with gladiator pit weapons and stuff i mean those are the kind of things that that uh they they have so what i'm doing with my lead belchers i'm picking out areas that i'm going to paint silver just to give a little bit of a pop to to the blue. So the vent ports back here. Um, any kinds of silver parts. 
So with the introduction of the uh, Codex, uh, Codex Astartes, most of the legions lost their individuality. And that's why you have what's termed as the, the vanilla marines compared to other you know, mer legions that they made into books, uh, their own separate codexes. But yeah, in, in, in the 30 er 30k era days of the Great Crusade, there wasn't, there wasn't much. So each of the writers of the, the Black Library books gets to kind of, kind of add their own little flavor. Avedon Black. And I think that's pretty neat. They get it passed and they write it down and it gets published and all of a sudden it becomes the, you know, it becomes almost law. So one of my favorite examples of this is the Dark Angels book, The Scent of Angels, where the sp space marines don't even come into the story until, you know, a good two thirds of the way through and the whole first Two thirds of the book, you're just reading about this culture on this planet, Caliban, and I loved it. But I wasn't used to it when I first got into the Black Library stuff. So when I I, I was reading A Thousand Suns for the first time, I was like, "Where's all the fighting? Where's all the all the action?" And I thought this was, was a 40k novel. Why isn't there any any awesome action set pieces? And it was because the whole premise of the Thousand Sons is that they are a, uh, they're like warrior scholars. So where you've got fighters like the, the Space Wolves who are kind of like a weapon and you point them at the enemy and you say kill it and they'll run forward and they'll kill it. And where you've got like uh, strategists, strategists, I mean like for example the Ultramarines or the Iron, uh, the, not the Iron Hands, the Imperial Fists who build up fortifications and fortify palaces or you've got the iron warriors that use their their grasp of mathematics and siege warfare to break down an enemy the thousand sons were known as the thinkers the warrior scholars who would okay the next step is a dry brush of temple guard blue and what dry brush means, for those of you who don't know, is you take your brush, you dip it a little bit into the paint, and then you wipe it off either on a Kleenex, or sometimes I use my own hand until there's not that much left on the brush itself. And then you go a little bit of, at a slanted angle, and you just get the uh, top most of the paint pigment onto your model. <clears throat> it's called a dry brush because I guess ideally you want the brush to be almost completely wiped off of the paint and I remember when I first started learning this t technique I thought well what a what a waste of paint and I, I really was kind of against doing it but then I didn't really realize how much paint we use uh, we really use a lot of paint if we're not careful we put it on too sloppily and too thickly, and uh, it's just really, uh, really a a little bit more of a better technique to to be a little bit more sparing with your paint <clears throat> than than just slapping it on the figures, if that makes any sense. And once you get this done, you can get your Balthazar gold out because now we're going to go to the trim and all of the details. Um, be really good at the fighting, but also at the um, at, the, at the, the learning and the mastery of knowledge, both arcane and practical. Lead Belcher. So they are the legion with the, this mutation in their gene seed, where their genetic structure, where the space marines have a very high number of psychers or psychic, psychically gifted 
uh, individuals. And the psychically gifted individuals oops, uh, were trained and encouraged to study the warp, which was what they called the Great Ocean. And uh, that, that, that's what makes these guys different from any other legion of space marines. Where other legions were trained, a lot of them were just trained to fight in different ways to fight and be used as, as weapons. These guys were trained to also think, and I think that's really fantastic. Okay, now we're getting into the gold. As you can see, I've already started on the bottom rims. Now what I, I was actually doing was I was batch painting some of my squad, uh, trying to get used to the, the patterns and everything, and uh, I ended up accidentally painting this guy's uh, boot bottoms in Balthazar Gold. He was just sitting with the rest of my batch painting guys, so... Um, what, what I usually like to do is when I'm batch painting, I get a whole squad together, right? And then I'll do one thing that I can remember to do over the whole squad. Especially if you do a lot of figures, like 50 night goblins, 100 skaven slaves. This is a great technique in order to keep yourself from going crazy. Just take one and paint what you want to paint. So in this case, I did the rims of the boots and then... I just put it on the side and I face it away from me. Then I get the second model, paint the bottoms of the boots, put it right next to the first one facing away from me. You go all the way down the line, facing them away from you each time, and uh, make rows and squads if you want to. That's what I did for my Vostroyans. I put them in nice little ordered squads of 10 or 20. And I uh, also did that with my Krieg, you might notice, in my older Krieg videos. Death core of Krieg. And then, pretty soon, you get to the end, and you've got your entire horde of models all facing away with you with the bottoms of their rims completely painted. Then you just go to the next step. <clears throat> in this case, I'm painting the rims on all of the leg armor. Now, for some of you, that might be too soul-draining and too mind-numbing. To do so you might want to do two steps or maybe want to do a whole uh, section before you move to the next model so you might want to do all of the leg armor trim i'm gonna tell you right now doing the trim highlighting the trim of space marine armor usually the part that takes the longest for me uh, because you're doing detail work here with the brush you're getting in there and you're trying to be as neat and precise as possible so for this pre-shading section, don't worry about being completely, completely perfect. Believe me, once the shade is on, and once you're painting with the washes, uh, you're going to make some mistakes, and you're going to notice that those mistakes get covered up pretty nicely. And what doesn't get covered up by the shades and the washes, any mistakes you do make, they will turn out okay, because you're going to highlight them back up with the original color and uh, any mistake can be looked over fairly fairly easily if you're just a little bit patient okay for the tabard we've got a little zinch sign so i'm gonna paint the amulet there it looks like this is oh is that flash i thought it was like a little tooth or something hanging from the bottom but it might be flash oh fine cast I think it's fine cast, you guys. It's fine cast flash, like right down the bottom there. Oh, man, that's really kind of disheartening. Ah, well, what are you going to do? Okay, so I'm going to paint the rim of this jewel piece and set into the gauntlets. Probably should have waited to paint the black until after that part was done. The rim with a hawk casing. So now you can see our, our guy is starting to take shape. And um, believe me, when you're doing these steps, the first base coat stages, and you're slogging through a horde of guys, especially if you're doing models like... Space Marine's not so bad, but when you find yourself doing like Skaven or Zombies or something where you really, really need lots and lots of models, then um, it's always good to have 
a uh, something to be listening to to play in the background to kind of take your mind off of what you're doing when you're trying to slog through 50 or a hundred you know night goblin robes then yeah you want something to take take the mind off so podcasts music get a playlist going music that you like to listen to I've found that painting my Warhammer models has made me dig back into my memory into my library of songs things that I used to listen to back in high school and you'll be surprised some of these old songs pop up and you'll forget that you like them and you'll forget that you used to listen to these old songs uh, Blues Traveler for me the old older Guns N' Roses stuff I mean so much stuff out there that you know all of us can can think of songs that we forgot that we even liked if you just go back and I think this is the this is the time to find those songs when you're slogging through a Warhammer painting session just get as as much random songs as you can and think back to the good old days okay uh, so we've been doing shoulder pads uh, the the edging on all these things We're getting to the helmet now head crest little little bit like the um, corn berserkers with the tall tall crest the corn berserkers have a little bit more of a the shape to it though a little bit more of a distinct pattern these are pretty pretty close I found this great blog of a Thousand Suns player who made a pre-heresy Thousand Suns army and he converted the Spire Guard, I guess the Imperial Guard unit that lives on the planet is called the Spire Guard, the Prospero Spire Guard, and um, he converted them using Elysian drop trooper heads, Cadian shock trooper torsos, and it looks like white or the the high elf legs, but he uses them in such a way and he puts them together in such a way that it really looks very very nice so uh, I, I don't have his information offhand but I just look I was just looking at earlier earlier today if you google pre heresy thousand suns blog you'll know it when it pops up because it's it's got like the most stuff on it really good stuff when you google search it Uh, fantastic I love the story of how they were the uh, only legion to be to be uh, marked out by how how many psychers there are the their connection to the to the warp and uh, how how in tune they were such a shame the the tragic story of how they Kind of dabbled too much into sorcery and magic and how they were condemned for it and the space wolves attacked and destroyed their planet kind of was that nail in the coffin it's interesting to read the book as uh, yeah so for for thousand suns players for for anybody out there looking for something new and different i suggest picking it up give it a read it's a very very good book yeah, I believe that's all the gold. There's some silver bits I missed, so I'm going to go back to my lead belcher now because we missed the um, the little back side vents to the backpack, as well as uh, some parts in the piping on the front. And oh, hello, golden spikes. So for all of my Space Marines, you'll notice that uh, Chaos or Loyalist, Chaos Legions or Loyalist Chapters, I kind of keep the same general paint scheme for all the backpacks. 
and uh, sometimes I'll change it up, but mostly I keep it keep it mostly the same. They've got little vents in the front or wires or or uh, anything like that. I'll paint them usually in the same color to match the ones next to them. Um, here he's got these little tubes on the side of his mask, so we're going to paint them silver. He's got a grill on the front of his mask, so we're going to paint that silver. And I've noticed that these little s center sections going all the way up are usually painted in silver as well. Last step before we get into the washes is Abaddon Black into all of the joint armors one more time. We're also going to paint back over the gems. So let's start with the joint armor. Then I think I saw one right here by the elbow. Usually the left hand if they're holding the bolter up in that classic Space Marine bolter slung across the chest kind of deal, then their left arm will have this black uh, joint armor exposed. And, oh, I see a little wire there, so we're going to paint the wire black. I'm also going to paint the eyeballs, eye sockets black, rather. And, yeah, like I said, the little gems, which will be painted over soon. Very cool. Yeah, so um, maybe build yourself some Spire Guard or some Imperial Guard Guardsmen, Trader Imperial Guards that you can say are running with your Thousand Sons and you can run them as allies in your Thousand Sons army list. So the next thing we're going to do before we go back into the shades is actually the final step is we're going to take some Temple Guard Blue and we're going to go back over and fix any mistakes that we might have made. Yeah, I'm just going to look for major mistakes. Like here on the shoulder pad, you can see where the gold kind of flaked off. So any big ones like that, you don't have to get too perfect with them, but for, for any big splotches of color that don't belong there, you're going to want to get the correct uh, color coloring on it. So mostly check the check the armor, check the um, shoulder pads, and any large areas like that. Okay, so go ahead and take a second to do that now, and when you're ready, come back and join us with your Drakenhof Nightshade. Okay, we are just about ready. Last bit of detail I'm getting is these little spikes on the side of our legionnaire's leg armor. So much detail. I'm reading this great conspiracy, or not conspiracy, but this great theory going around the internet that the Blood Ravens of the Dawn of War game, Abaddon Black, are actually a successor chapter of the Thousand Sons. And they point to a couple of reasons for this, notably among those being that uh, Araman appears in the games, and in the novel A Thousand Sons, one of the characters who can foresee into the future, spoiler alert, um, mentions in one of her um, visions of the future, she specifically talks about a bloody raven and um, she mentions it in one of her ramblings, so that's pretty cool. Alright, so now we're going to get into the washes, and the wash we're going to use is... Uh, we're actually going to use this, Lamian Medium, and we're going to use Drakenhof Nightshade. If I can find it, where put it? here we go. Now the thing about Drakenhof Nightshade is on its own it is so dense and thick as a pigment that it uh, will really just be too dark and it will 
uh, it'll obscure all the detail because it'll just make everything too dark. But with Lamian Medium mixed in, you uh, get a, a pretty diluted and easier to control effect. So having a wet palette around is usually a good idea for, for when you're applying this wash. I usually use about the same amount of Lamian Medium to Drakenhof Nightshade. Alright, so now that I've mixed it up, I'm just going to put it on the model and just drag it around so that it seeps into all of the different uh, recesses on it. A good place to test out if your your shade or your wash is thick enough or thin enough is to uh, experiment by dragging it down the back under the backpack because uh, that way if it's too dark it's uh, it's really dark back there anyway because of the shade and if it's too light then you can add a little bit more shade to your wet palette that's kind of where I, I test it out first, uh, if I can. You always want to make sure that you turn the model in as many directions as you can while you're getting all the different angles. If you're using the Thousand Suns with the specific Thousand Sun arms, the arms have all these ridges on it, which is going to make it really important that you um, get get it into all of the different shaded areas. Also under the under the different parts of the arm armor as well, by the elbow pad, by the shoulder pads. Just want to make sure you have good smooth coverage. Go to the backpack, drag it down. You really don't have to do much more than that. Now, if we didn't use Lamian Medium, if you don't have it, I rec uh, recommend getting a little bit of water to thin down your Drakenhof Nightshade. Anything where you're not using it straight out of the bottle. Because as it is, like I said, Drakenhof Nightshade will be really, really dark. And um, it's just really, really hard to control as well. All right, so there you have it. I've put the wash everywhere, made sure that I've distributed it evenly, and we're checking for any large pools of shade. Make sure that it's not accumulating anywhere where it shouldn't. And uh, that's gonna wrap up the video for part one. So stay tuned for part two. Actually, the last thing I forgot to do, hello. Last thing I forgot to do was shade the um, little loincloth there, so we're using Seraphim Sepia. Seraphim Sepia is a great color because it's it, uh, it really gives a very aged look to things like bone, parchment, And it also colors gold nicely, so it's really nice added bonus. When we start highlighting this thing back up and adding our script to it, then it'll be a nice, nice shade to work up from. All right, so there we have it. Um, don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.